Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. Today's guest on the Cognitive Crucible is Mr. Duan Lee, who is the Senior Director of Research and Strategy at Zignal Labs, a leading AI-empowered media intelligence analytics and influence risk solutions company. He leverages emerging AI technologies to support and enable open society and national security. Mr. Lee is a national security expert specializing in disinformation analysis and great power competition in the information environment. Before joining Zignal Labs, Mr. Lee was a faculty member and principal investigator at the Naval Postgraduate School, where his work focused on countering violent extremist networks and author authoritarian regimes. Duan Lee, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you so much, John. I'm really excited to join this podcast. Well, we are excited to have you. And to start things off, I'm hoping that you can give our audience a little bit more background about your career and your national security expertise. Oh, thank you, John. Yes, I'm delighted to offer a little bit more context. So I was trained as a political scientist uh, and quantitative methodology. Uh, I got my first teaching job at the Naval Postgraduate School. And uh, my sort of you know, professional focus has been on understanding the nexus between uh, state actors and non-state actors. Uh, in the past 10 years, uh, the nexus uh, was really pronounced in irregular warfare and information warfare. And that kind of defined my professional portfolio. Uh, initially, I started using a lot of social network analysis to understand how violent extremist networks or terrorist organizations uh, come about and expand, leveraging different resources in the general population. Uh, perhaps in the past five years, the nexus kind of shifted to the uh, information environment. And um, I've been working very closely with several uh, federal government R&D agencies to understand how our country can combat this information more effectively, both in the information environment as well as in the physical world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know, that defines you know who I am, what I care about, and I think you know if you think about how much mis and disinformation is propagating about mm -hmm. the whole coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, now I think the threat of disinformation goes well beyond just national security. It touches mm -hmm. on public health, public safety, as well as electoral integrity. Right. Well, uh, I I think there's a lot to talk about there. I, I think it might be helpful to linger for just a moment on the notion of disinformation and fake news. Um, the, I'm sure you have some thoughts or some more, uh, uh, you know, a precise definition of, you know, what exactly disinformation and fake news is, how it works, and you know why it is uh, something that is so you know top of mind these days. Yeah. So let me start with you know why it is becoming so pervasive. Um, outside two major factors behind the proliferation of this information. One mm -hmm. is that when it comes to statecraft, I think our country has been predominant in on several domains, right? Think about like the land domain, right? Think about the air domain, think about even the space domain, right? So a lot of our peer competitors essentially, you know, had to find a domain where they may have some kind of comparative advantage and also very cost effective, right? We still have the largest economy in the world and a lot of our peer competitors cannot marshal the kind of resources for traditional national security measures, right? So in that sense, uh, they've been 
striving to find that you know gap where they don't have mm -hmm. kind of compared disadvantage and that is also very cost effective to you know uh, grow at scale right think right. about like aircraft carriers it takes years of r d tons of money to field on the aircraft carrier group and etc right but if you think about how to use perhaps social media or other digital media platforms uh, to essentially compete against our mm -hmm. national interests overseas, the information environment is a super cost effective platform for a lot of them. So that is one factor. And related to the first factor is essentially the increasing connectivity of the physical world, right? So back in the day, we used to say six degrees of separation, right? And that was like perhaps a generation ago. Right now, an average person has about 161 immediate ties, right? Uh, mostly on the information environment. So think about access and placement, think about reach, right? And this like you know, rapidly increasing connectivity is also what enables a lot of regional states to exploit this information at scale. Yeah, now, yeah. Let me that, I mean, that, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that, that this is really emerging as a uh, persistent theme. Uh, the, the especially your your first point that uh, the technology today is cheap and it's available and it's uh, scalable and it's something that any nation state can deploy uh, to great effect, to asymmetric effect, uh, and compete directly with the United States and, and the West's uh, you know, technological advantage or our, our infrastructure advantage. You're talking about you know, uh, aircraft carriers and you know, our robust Department of Defense and kinetic capabilities are being greatly challenged by this very inexpensive, scalable information and weaponized AI technology. Precisely. And um, to me, what is really concerning is the emergence of completely different political systems about technology, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what really worries me about this rise of disinformation as a strategic you know, toolkit is that you know, AI can be only as sophisticated as the kind of training data right, that you ingest to essentially make AI smarter and more scalable, right? And to me, the rise of revisionism and especially the rise of <clears throat> authoritarian regimes in the information environment is particularly troubling. The reason being, they can exploit a large volume of user data to come up with incredibly weaponized AI systems. And we already see this manifestation in a lot of authoritarian regimes using disinformation campaigns against us, against the West, against the liberal uh, political order. So this is something mm -hmm. that we should pay a lot of attention to moving forward. Right. Well, so uh, your, your expertise includes uh, disinformation in, uh, in conjunction with crises. It could so we're, I mean we'll come to the current COVID crisis and disinformation. Uh, do you have any other uh, examples of previous crises that have also had a disinformation campaign that's been you know part part of the effort? Of course. Uh, in fact, uh, disinformation has always been a, a, a recurring theme in all major uh, crises or conflict, right? So think about, you know, Patton's, you know, Third Army during uh, the Normandy invasion, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, military deception has been a, a, an enduring feature of warfare period. I think is the, the trend has not changed very much, but it's the pace is the scale that has changed dramatically. Let me give you a couple of more examples. Um, you know, um, 
during um, the Crimean you know, crisis, we saw the same pattern, right? Uh, yeah. Because when there is instability, right? People have this desire to seek corroborating information, right? But instability also undermines the you know, viability of existing communication infrastructure, right? Because journalists cannot go to you know, war zones freely, right? Uh, media like you know, outlets cannot go to you know, uh, fail states freely. And this is the gap and scene that a lot of revisionist states, namely the Kremlin and the CCP, are exploiting to quite effect. So we saw the same pattern during the uh, Ukraine uh, civil war. In fact, you know, if you look at the um, Ukraine, the 2019 Ukraine presidential election, there was a massive wave of disinformation coming from the Kremlin. So it used to be uh, an afterthought when it comes to understanding great power competition, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. IO or information warfare was something of a support element. But I feel like you know, that relationship mm. is essentially in reverse order right now because, you know, again, you know, when it comes to great power competition, the only, I mean, there are two domains that our competitors are really trying to uh, take the upper hand on, and that is cyber and information. Right, and you're, you're touching on something that I think is a, a, a critical difference uh, 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 in the way that the United States tends to deploy information operations compared to our great power competitors. And that's namely that, you know, we deploy information operations in support of uh, uh, other kinetic operations, whereas uh, China and Russia may be uh, deploying information operations continually as part of a just status quo uh, operations below the level of armed conflict. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think, you know, to me, this is, I mean, I don't want to get too philosophical about... Uh, no, that's about fine. Get, get, um, get philosophical. Um, yeah, but... You know, to me, this is the main difference between, um, you know, uh, what I call Westphalian statecraft and revolutionary statecraft. And that is, if you look at the CCP and the Kremlin, they still retain a lot of revolutionary, you know, uh, TTPs, right? And the main difference is that, you know, Westphalian statecraft is based on, you know, what I call explosion or external pressure, right? The revolutionary uh, counterparts focus on what I call implosion, right? And that is when they see vulnerabilities in our society, right? You know, how do you essentially amplify and exploit those vulnerabilities, right? Without having to get into any domain where we reign supreme, right? And, and the answer is very simple, right? They cannot reach, you know, different dissident groups or like, you know, political, like, you know, organizations or protests, events in the United States directly. You know, physically they cannot do it. You know, in terms of the human domain, it's hard to do it, right? But when they use this information, right, as a strategic tool, they can easily exploit our internal divisions. To me, that really defines the crux of what I call revolutionary statecraft. Mm. Perhaps that is something that we need to revisit because it is in our strategic DNA. You know, let's remember that this nation has started as the most effective revolution movement against the most powerful empire of the day. Right, right. So uh, this starts leading us into the current COVID crisis. And so our, um, you know, adversaries have AI tools to potentially, uh, you know, to algorithmically understand, you know, where are the fault lines in our public discourse, and then also AI tools to exploit those uh, fault lines. And so what are the types of things 
that you are observing uh, that are you know either most likely or most definitely uh, information attack vectors from mm -hmm. you know from some of our adversaries that you know relevant to the current COVID crisis. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I do see some um, experimental TTPs uh, coming from the CCP and the uh, Kremlin. And, and namely, uh, they, they try really hard to establish uh, plausible deniability. Mm. And that mm -hmm. is a really hard business to get into when it comes to disinformation mitigation. What I mean by that is fairly straightforward, and that is, they don't do overt, uh, like you know, state-centric information operations. They employ a large army of seemingly legitimate media outlets. And those are the media outlets they target in overseas information environments as well. And that is, this goes back to the crux of my professional uh, life, and that is understanding the nexus between state actors and non-state actors, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, what the CCP is doing really well is, you know, I don't want to sound like a paranoid person, but I think we should err on the side of caution. And that is, you know, there are a lot of, you know, diaspora communities um, in the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they have their local, you know, media outlets and so on and so forth. And essentially, they maintain these large networks of "quote unquote" friendly outlets, right, uh, to push their um, disinformation, targeting perhaps existing, you know, racial divisions or social yeah. economic, you know, divisions, and so on and so forth. So I was really—I'll give you a very concrete example. You know, when we were going through uh, civil unrest or civil rights movements in the past few months, right? Um, you're, you're talking about it with within the United States? Yes, within the United States. Right? Okay, yeah, so civil unrest that's been like sparked by, you know, uh, the, death of uh, George Floyd the, the, and, the George Floyd event and probably yeah. exacerbated by just a, a general feeling of uh, worry and uncertainty with the whole virus and, and everything. Yeah, and it goes to both sides of the ideological spectrum, right? Because we've seen also a lot of perhaps anti-mask protests, right? Yeah. So I'm not being you know, political. I'm just trying to make sure that we understand that they do not discriminate any political Understood. Yeah. action across the ideological spectrum, right? And the idea is that I've seen a lot of you know, you know, CCP-affiliated outlets perhaps amplifying the most radical elements on the left side of the spectrum, while the Kremlin affiliated or Kremlin friendly outlets would be amplifying and exploiting the most fringe elements of the far right of the ideological spectrum, right? And this is really troubling to me because, you know, perhaps like, you know, between 15 and 16, it was mostly just the Kremlin trying to essentially polarize our organic political discourse. Now, it's not just the Kremlin trying to, you know, exacerbate mm -hmm. that polarization. And in terms of like, you know, who has the most resources to exacerbate this kind of coordinated disinformation? You know, Russia, you know, we, we think that Russia is like, you know, 10 feet tall, right? But it's still, you know, the eleventh, you know, largest economy in the world, right? They're like, you know, you know, GDP per capita is is laughable, right? China, on the other hand, is a, a completely different beast. And what worries me is that the CCP is learning from the success of the Kremlin's disinformation campaigns, and they're doing it at scale, not regionally but globally, and and this is perhaps. The, the the most like a menacing threat that I want to share with your audience. Mm. Uh, did I hear you correctly? Uh, don't, don't let me put words in your mouth. But in your professional opinion, do you do you think that at 
at at some level there is uh, coordination between China and Russia, and you know hitting opposite ends of the political spectrum, for example, in you know customized information campaigns. Or do you think that that there's not sufficient evidence to be able to state that kind of thing? Yeah, um, I, I would like you know, um, uh, you know, I feel inclined to side with the latter. Uh, okay. You know, I see collusion, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but coordination is something that is much harder to yeah. establish, especially yeah. just you know relying on you know open source intelligence, right? But there are certain indications that I find quite troubling, and the idea is that you know. I see a lot of, you know, uh, Kremlin TTPs being employed by the CCP at scale. So I do think there is a lot of mimicking going on. There is mm -hmm. a lot of strategic learning going on on the CCP's part, right? Um, and also there is another like, you know, uh, indication I wanna share with your audience. And that is just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Chinese, um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and their counterpart in Russia essentially came up with a joint statement stating that they will essentially cooperate to mitigate Western disinformation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I'm reading is the opposite, and that is, hey, you know, we can achieve much greater effects by working together against the United States and against the West. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see a lot more bilateral, you know, cooperative um, initiative taking place between the CCP and the Kremlin. And that should be highly troubling to all national security um, stakeholders and, and, and leaders. Right. Well, so in the U.S., we tend to be you know, hyper-focused on on us, right? It, it's it's all about me, right? I'm 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 the most important person in the world to me, and I think the U.S. we we tend to feel that way about ourselves. Uh, but you're you're alluding to uh, you know worldwide scalable information operations, which are you know not just targeted at the U.S., but you know there's uh, Africa and. Uh, uh, developing nations throughout the world, which are presumably also being uh, uh, targeted with information campaigns by both Ro uh, Russia and and China. Uh, do you have any any thoughts about the kinds of information campaigns that are being uh, levied at the the third world or the emerging? Yeah, economies? yeah, yeah. I think that's a great question, John, and. Um, um, to me, like, you know, um, I, I'm always trying to, you know, peel as many layers as I can and trying to understand, you know, what, what, what what's causing this, right? And speaking of, you know, CCP propaganda in the rest of the world, right? Um, to me, uh, there is an important, you know, background factor to consider, and that is, you know, I'm pretty sure you are familiar with the Road and Belt Initiative. That means yes. uh, the CCP has a lot more assets and projects they need to maintain overseas, right? Uh, and, yeah, it, it 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 may be helpful f for our audience. Uh, yeah. Duan, could could you yeah. give just a thirty second on on what the Belt and Road Initiative yeah. is? Um, you know, uh, unlike our economy, the Chinese economy depends on external trade a lot more, right? And uh, in order to uh, dump some of its overcapacity, production capacity, uh, the, the CCP has been pushing this overseas infrastructure and logistics, you know, projects quite a bit, uh, oftentimes uh, being very aggressive with uh, loan programs to essentially install uh, developing countries with what we call, you know, debt trap, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, maritime logistics or like, you know, uh, land-based, you know, logistics. So these represent perhaps Xi Jinping's most ambitious strategic uh, endeavor. Right. It's a, like a yeah. spra sprawling trade 
infrastructure with 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 uh, which favors uh, China policies correct, and correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, GDP. Because, you know, they have to sell, right? You know, and, and to sell effectively, they need essentially effective logistics, right? Yeah. So so and, and they had to dump a lot of you know overproduction capacity. Um essentially it's you know what I call like a you know, strategic dumping, right? Mm. So it, it is not to benefit these developing countries very much. So so that is one key background we need to take into account, and that is now that you have a lot more Chinese personnel. Chinese projects overseas, right? And and you need to essentially ensure that they are well perceived by local populations. So in that sense, there is you know this palpable increase of you know strategic propaganda outside you know China and and essentially like you know outside United States as well. And let me add another sort of you know observation to that statement. Uh, also, let's look at you know Russia's economy. Um, Russia's economy depends on two things, right? Energy and weapon sales. Period. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think you know Russia has any more like you know, strategic industries than those two areas, right? Now, you know, energy uh, to export energy, you need a lot of pipelines, right? And this mm -hmm. is where the CCP and the Kremlin are also coordinating quite a bit, but. They're also competing interests, especially in Central Asia, right? Uh, weapon sales, you know, uh, where do they go? They follow conflicts, right? So again, Russia has a lot of assets and personnel in highly volatile regions and countries, right? And of course, whenever they uh, interface with local populations, then there is this need for information operations. And I think this kind of economic dynamics really underpin, right, the proliferation of aggressive and strategic information operations taking place in a large number of developing countries. Well, uh, fascinating stuff, uh, Duan. Um, you know, to, for during every discussion, I like to try to uh, ask our guests to to share with the audience a a book or or two which they may not otherwise be familiar with, which you know helps illuminate some of this discussion area a little bit more. Have do do, do, you, do you have a couple of favorites that uh, that talk about these kind kinds of things? Absolutely, John. Um, you know, uh, part of my job is you know understanding. Uh, not only the cutting edge, um, you know, uh, developments, but also understanding the bleeding edge developments, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, my first recommendation would be, and um, you know, full disclosure, you know, um, I've known Peter Singer for a while, so I may come okay. up a little bit partial, but Noted. I do think that he is the best futurist we've had in our generation. So, Like War by Peter Singer. It's already about two years old, but uh, it is essentially becoming this like, you know, uh, contemporary like manifestation of, you know, what we're going through right now, right? Because he's essentially talking about the weaponization of social media and digital media data, right? And, and even though it's two years old, if you read it right now, you'll be shocked how many you know, analogous, um, you know, uh, incidents we're experiencing right now. So I think it's a must for all, you know, information warfare, um, you know, stakeholders, analysts, planners, right? Uh, in fact, I think it, it is a mandatory reading for a lot of uh, military training programs at this point. And he has a new book just came out this year. It's called Burn In. Uh, I think it's also a must because Burn in addresses the social and political implications of, you know, AI and automation technology. Right? How is going to redefine right. politics? How is going to redefine, you know, public safety? How is it going to redefine law enforcement? So I think those are great books to read. You know, right now, and um, there's also a more like you know. Uh, um, diplomacy uh, related in a book on information warfare and it's called Information Wars by Rick Stengel. 
Um, he was the longest serving, um, I think, deputy secretary for the State Department. So he understands how perhaps our peer competitors uh, use informational operations as a predominantly primary strategic tool, right? And, you know, mm. I want to really emphasize that notion, right? You know, we are coming back to that notion a couple of times, but, you know, we really have to understand the reach and the cost effectiveness of informational warfare in our yeah. DNA, right? Yeah. And, and you know, again, increasing connectivity, you know, and, and, you know, the proliferation of digital technology and so on and so forth, you know, a missile is really expensive, but a tweet can reach potentially millions of people, thousands, tens of thousands of miles away, right? To me, that is really the best remote warfare weapon system, period. Yeah, it is. Um, it is astonishing, and uh, it's it's astonishing how how much this threat has. Uh, snuck up on us and exploited the uh, you know weaknesses in, you know that that are you know baked into the the underside of our uh, magnificent you know technological infrastructure. Uh, it's you know so much like the um, you know in the the very first Star Wars movie, right? You know finding mm -hmm. that finding that exhaust port. Uh, to uh, you know, drop a drop a bomb in and destroy the Death Star, right? It's kind of like that. You know, the information uh, you know can seep into our consciousness, into our infrastructure, into our society, and uh, uh, you know, as as of today, we are extremely vulnerable to yeah. uh, that, yeah. kind of, uh, that kind of that kind of attack. Yeah. So, you know, I, I want to like, you know, um, offer two, you know, um, concluding remarks, uh, John, if you don't mind. Um, uh, one is that going back to the Star Wars analogy, you know, let's not forget that countless, you know, rebel spies had died to get the schematics of the Death Star, right? Mm, mm, and there is mm. always that, you know, human factor. And that is like, you know, the power of, you know, weaponizing information, you know, is one thing, right? But to make it as impactful and as resonating as possible, we also have to go back to the, 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 the logic of, you know, narrative, right? you know, how to tell stories that are humanizing, but also represent the best values in us. And essentially using that as an informational firewall against, you know, um, uh, adversarial disinformation, right? So I, I wanna like to reemphasize the human factor in all forms of warfare, not just information warfare, but in all forms of warfare, right? And number two, you know, we've been describing, you know, this problem set quite a bit, you know, I do also want to offer some, like, you know, perhaps, um, you know, corrective measures, right? And and that is, again, you know, I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record, but let me go back to the nexus between state actors and non-state actors. And that is, we need, really need to find the right matching parity, right? The reason that, you know, cyber warfare and information warfare are proving so difficult to us is that, it's just a volume, right? And, you know, we have only so many analysts, we have only so many, you know, cyber warriors, we have only so many OSINT, you know, analysts, right? The difficulty a lot of times stems from this organizational parity issue. And that is we're not tapping into the largest, like, you know, force we have at our disposal. And that is essentially our own civil society. So it cannot be state-centric alone, right? And, and this is why in the past three years, I've been really advocating for, right? You know, the triple piece, right? Public, private partnership, so mm -hmm. that we can, you know, compete effectively in the information environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, some uh, very, very, very hopeful words uh, and uh, constructive uh, solution possibilities um, 
very much appreciated. And of course, that's a, a big part of this project with the Cognitive Crucible and for the Information Professionals Association in general is uh, to try to to try to create that that whole of society or whole of government effort uh, to combat this information problem. And uh, with, with that, uh, Duan Lee, I would like to thank you so much for being on the Cognitive Crucible. John, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am truly honored to like, you know, make this little contribution to your endeavors, right? Um, and again, like, you know, um, let's do it again. The reason being, I don't think we talk a lot about like, you know, possible sort of, you know, uh, you know, solutions, technology, you know, uh, organization, and, and perhaps certain like, you know, partnership opportunities. So, you know, I'd like to come back at some point to talk more about the solution space. Wow, I, I uh, hardly agree. Let's, let's definitely put something out there to get you back on here at a future date. Thank you so much, Duan. Thank you so much, John. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.